Good evening and welcome to Upon This Rock. We do this every Wednesday night. It's your opportunity to join me in my study as we look at the Word of God together. And uh, tonight we're looking at John's Gospel again. Uh, we're up to episode seven. We're now in John chapter three. And just before we look at the Word of God together, uh, let's just uh, come into a time of worship. Janice is going to lead us in a great old hymn called uh, Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. in his blood. This is my story, this is my soul, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my soul, praising my Savior. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Saviour all the day long. We're moving now into John chapter 3, and uh, we're going to, as we get into John chapter 3, which of course is one of the most famous passages in Scripture, because you've got uh, the encounter with Nicodemus, the declaration that you must be born again, you've got John 3, 16, possibly the best known Bible verse uh, in the world, um, but also in John chapter 3, we have the first of what are described as the discourses of John. If you compare John's gospel with most of the other gospels, you'll notice something that there's these very lengthy either dialogues between two people or a monologue, Jesus speaking on his own. And this will be particularly obvious if you have a Bible, for example, that has the words of Jesus in red ink. You'll just see in John's Gospel, sometimes an entire chapter is almost all red ink. Uh, 
You get that to a slight, a smaller extent in Matthew's gospel and hardly at all in Mark and Luke. Now, why is it that John has all these discourses in it? Well, and also some people would ask this, how, how could he remember it all? I mean, how could he, you know, when we're looking, sometimes you might hear a preacher taking something that Jesus said and zeroing in just on one particular word. Well, how can we be sure that John remembered it all correctly, these big, long passages of where Jesus is talking? How could he remember that word for word? Well, first of all, why is it only in John? Well, I think the reason for why John has these discourses and the other Gospels don't is to do with the purpose why he was writing it. John was writing his Gospel to Christians at a time whenever the church was really starting to see itself as separate from the Jewish religion and where it stood in regard to the Jewish faith. And so a lot of John's discourses are things that Jesus spoke about that. Now, it's not that the other gospel writers didn't know about Jesus saying these things, but they just didn't fit in with their purpose. For example, uh, Mark's gospel was designed, written for the Romans, written for your average Gentile to get a quick picture of who Jesus is so that they could uh, follow him. Now, they don't need to know a lot of the stuff that John includes in his purpose for his gospel. And then there's, of course, the fact that John was an eyewitness of the events that took place. Uh, Luke was not. L Luke, Luke came along after Jesus, was a companion of Paul who carefully researched and spoke to eyewitnesses. Uh, same, same with Mark. Mark, while we believe Mark was there for some of the events in the gospel, he wasn't for most of them. And uh, of, of course, Matthew was one of the 12 apostles, but John was also part of the inner circle. There were times whenever, if you, if you remember, there, there would be the three of them, uh, Peter, James and John would be taken aside with Jesus and uh, have revelations that maybe the other nine of the 12 apostles didn't have. And of course, how, how do we know that John remembered all this correctly? Well, a lot of that is down to the role of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The fact that we believe that the Holy Spirit guided and superintended the writers of the Word of God. Now, John uh, may, uh, back in those days, d people did have much better memories from memorizing speeches. Passing on what we call oral history was quite common uh, in the first century. And John may have even been noting things down. We don't, know, we don't know whether he did that or not. But also the Holy Spirit. This is the primary reason why we know we can rely on what John records of what Jesus said. Because the Holy Spirit guided him and directed him to do so. Now, we start in verse 1. It says, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. So uh, we all know about the Pharisees. Nicodemus was one of the Pharisees. Uh, he was a religious person of authority. Uh, he was also probably highly educated. Nicodemus is a Greek name. Generally, that meant somebody had traveled outside of Israel. They'd maybe studied uh, other places, lived in other places, came from other parts of the Roman Empire, had achieved uh, an education there, there that would be much broader than what they would get in Israel. Uh, also, of course, he was also powerful. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, of the ruling council. So uh, all, all in all, that this man would come to see Jesus was quite a big deal. And verse 2, he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. Now, when it says he came at night, uh, well, that's that's the time of day when he came. He came after dark, when it was night. He may have done this secretly because he didn't want people to know that he, as a prominent religious person, was coming to talk to the troublemaker, Jesus, who had just uh, cleansed the temple and overturned the money changers' tables and driven the animals out. But also, there may be a spiritual application when John says he came at night. John might well be referring to Nicodemus's own spirit spiritual condition that even though he was a leader in Israel he was in spiritual darkness because he had not yet come to know Jesus or the movement of the Holy Spirit in his life and uh, he's respectful he calls him a rabbi uh, but he says this we know that you are a teacher who has come from God and this can mean one of two things now now when he says we know he may just mean look it's well known 
but he may also have been speaking on behalf of a group of people. May have been a group of some of the other Pharisees or a group of other people that he was in touch with. But he comes to Jesus and he says, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you are doing if God was not with him. Now, so far, we've only had one miraculous sign described in this gospel, which was, of course, the turning of the water into wine at Cana of Galilee. And that, no doubt, people would have been talking about that. that you know, that an incident like that is not something people just forget about. They spread news about it. They, when, whenever the Galileans came up to the temple for the Passover, they would be telling everybody else about it. But also, the, another sign, it's not a miraculous sign, but the sign of Jesus cleansing the temple. Jesus saying, you know, destroy this temple, I will build it again in three days. So probably it's all of that together that, that Nicodemus is saying, you know, nobody could perform, the, do all this if God was not with him. And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Now, when Jesus says, I tell you the truth, it, it's literally Amen, amen. Jesus says, amen, amen. No one can see the kingdom of God until he has born again, until, unless he is born again. Now, obviously, we are used to using the word amen at the end of a prayer, and it means let it be so. It, it is done. It, 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 you know, that's, that's it. That's it. God has spoken. Um, we're in agreement. It's a, it's a word of agreement. But Jesus used it at the beginning of what he was about to say. Now, he also uses a double amen. He doesn't just say amen. He says, amen, amen. Now, that wasn't unusual. There were several of the Psalms finished by saying uh, amen and amen. Or sometimes I've been in churches and a preacher, somebody will pray and they will say amen. And everybody said, and we all go, amen, a double amen. But Jesus has a double amen at the beginning. And what's the significance of that? Because this is pretty unique. Well, I believe it's because of this. If you look in Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, God is described as the God of truth, and it's literally the God of amen. And then in Revelation, Jesus describes himself as, in, in the letters to the seven churches, to the church at Laodicea, Jesus describes himself as the amen, the faithful and true. And what I believe Jesus is saying here is about to make this statement. He's saying, amen, amen. God the Father, the God of amen, and God the Son, myself, the amen, the faithful and true. We are both declaring in all of our authority, you must be born again. In other words, he's saying, pin back your ears. Listen, this is one of the possibly the most important thing you will ever hear in your life. Nicodemus. So he says, Amen, Amen. And then he would have had Nicodemus's full attention. And that's when he says to him, um, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. And there it is, straight to the heart of the matter. You know, uh, by the way, again, can also be translated as from above. So Jesus, this can either be saying no one can see the kingdom of heaven unless he is born again or unless he's born from above. And both they amount to the same thing. You are born again by being born from above, by the, 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 the action of God himself and the spirit of God coming and moving within you. Verse four, how can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Now, listen, I don't believe that Nicodemus was stupid. I mean, he's not so stupid as to think Jesus is saying somebody's got to go back into their mother's womb. But this was a common, uh, among the rabbis, this was a common way of carrying on a discussion or a debate. When somebody said something that, that everyone could see was symbolic, you would say, well, obviously you're not referring to the uh, literal interpretation of that. So why don't you go on and tell us what you really mean by that? Or, you know, we might sometimes I in discussions today, I hear people saying, could you unpack that? A little bit. Could you explain more? And that was how the Jews used to do that. They would say, well, you obviously don't mean that literally, so let's go into what you actually mean by that. And so Nicodemus is actually saying to Jesus, well, look, you obviously don't mean we've got to go back into the mother's womb again. So what do you mean by being born again? 
And Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. Verse 5, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. So we're talking about two births here, the birth of water and the Spirit. Now, what does being born of water mean? And I've heard various suggestions, including it refers to baptism and everything else. But this, you see, that wouldn't make sense because Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. And, and Nicodemus is not going to have a clue about a Christian ritual of baptism that had not yet taken place. And so this has got to make sense to Nicodemus. And so probably born of water means natural birth, as when a woman's waters break before she delivers and goes into labor and delivers the baby. So when Jesus is saying um, that uh, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit, he's saying, obviously, you've got to have your first natural birth, but then you've got to have a second spiritual birth. Verse six, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. And, and right now, remember, Jesus is talking to a top religious leader Jesus puts his finger on the real problem with religion, because with any kind of religion, it, it doesn't even Christian religion, even Pentecostal religion, even born again Christians religion. We tend to get with our setups and our traditions and our ways of doing things. And eventually we can start doing things from the flesh. And you cannot do something of the flesh and expect a spiritual result. You, if you do something of the flesh, you get a flesh result. And that's why religion keeps letting us down. And that's why God has to come with reformations and reform and renew and sometimes even start something fresh with religion. Why? Because things can start out in the spirit and then we get stuck in a rut and we start doing things in the flesh. So Jesus is not saying that Nicodemus is a bad guy, but he's saying, look, you're, you're not born again. You're not moving in the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. Verse seven, you should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. But Nicodemus was surprised. I mean, he, he, he was a teacher in Israel, but he was surprised. He, he, the reason he was surprised was because he didn't think he needed to be born again. I mean, he's one of God's people. He's one of the chosen people. Why, you know, they didn't believe that they needed to be saved. They thought being part of God's people, that was enough. Now they all had to do was wait, uh, be faithful, obey the law, wait for the Messiah to come and fulfill the kingdom. But Jesus says to him, verse eight, uh, again, he says, verse seven, you should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. Uh, by the way, wind in Greek is the same word as spirit. The word pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A. Uh, it's a word that comes into the English language. Pneumonia, pneumatic. You know, pneumatic drill is one that's powered by air. Pneumonia is something that affects your lungs where you breathe air. And so the word pneuma, it meant wind, it, it meant uh, breath, and it meant spirit. And Jesus says here, he, he says that the wind blows wherever it pleases, as does the spirit. You hear it, it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. You see, Sometimes you can't see the spirit moving, but you can see the effects of the spirit moving. You can't see the wind, but you can see the effects of the wind. You might not understand that now, of course, today, scientifically, we have a much greater idea of why the wind blows the way it does. Back then, they didn't. They didn't understand the wind, but they could feel the effects of the wind. And Jesus is, in effect, saying to Nicodemus, look, you don't understand about the spirit, but you can still feel the effects of the spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. In verse 10, you are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Well, no, he didn't understand these things. He, You see, Nicodemus was waiting for what, as, as a Jew, waiting for the Messiah to come. He was waiting for what God would do for him, not what God was going to do to him and in him. And Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, before you see God doing something for you, you've got to allow God to do something in you and to you. So, so that's why Jesus says this to him. And he says, you are Israel's teacher. Now, that not just a teacher. He says, you are the teacher of Israel. 
Nicodemus must have been an outstanding teacher in the Jewish religion, and yet still he didn't understand about the Holy Spirit. Verse 11, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. Now again, when he says at the beginning there, truly I say, it's again, it's amen, amen. So this tells us Jesus is saying something really important here in verse 11. He's saying, amen, amen. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. Now, it's, it's obvious there that something's going on because we've now changed from the singular into the plural. Before this, Jesus was saying, I, I, I. Now he says, we, we, we. Why? Because he's talking about himself and the disciples. And Jesus is actually, for the first time, raising with Nicodemus something that is a key uh, theme in John's Gospel. And that is not just about Jesus coming as the Messiah, but that Jesus will build his church. And that the church is going to be uh, a testimony to the truth. And that the church is going to witness to the truth of Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's, you know, elsewhere in John, he speaks about his own testimony. He speaks about the Father's testimony. But now he's also speaking about his joint testimony with the disciples when he says, we testify to what we have seen, but you still, you people, do not accept our testimony. Of course, that would come much more apparent later on in John's Gospel and later on in Christian history when the leadership, many, many Jews, of course, would receive the Gospel, but the official leadership of Judaism would reject Jesus as Messiah. Verse 12, I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things. Jesus is saying these things are basic. You know, I'm using simple illustrations with you about the wind and giving birth and, and, the, uh, and everything else. And look, if you can't even understand that, then how on earth will you grasp the greater things? You know, if you can't even understand that you need to be born again, how can you ever understand something like the Trinity? You never will. And, and so, what Jesus is actually saying here is that Nicodemus' problem is that he's relying on understanding rather than on faith. Jesus doesn't say you, your problem is you don't understand. He says the problem is you don't believe. And sometimes we think we've got to understand something absolutely fully, all the ins and outs of it to our intellectual satisfaction before we can believe it. And if in the end, you know, the gospel I mean, we should understand the gospel. We should study to show ourselves approved of God. But ultimately, the gospel is not a matter of what you understand. It's a matter of what you believe as you embrace the person of Jesus Christ and enter into a relationship with him. And Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, if you don't believe what I'm saying to you now, then how on earth can you believe what happens in the future? Well, thank God we know that probably Nicodemus did end up believing what Jesus was saying now, because we'll meet Nicodemus again as we work through John's Gospel, and in a very positive way as well. So, verse 13. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. And this is where Jesus is really getting into some stuff that's going to really stretch Nicodemus's mind as a Jewish teacher, because Jesus is actually saying, I've, I've already been in eternity. I've come from heaven. I've been in the presence of the Father. I've sat in the throne room of God, and now I've come to meet you. Well, for a Jew, that was just absolutely unimaginable. But Jesus is saying, you know, no one's ever gone into heaven, but I've been in heaven and I can talk to you about heaven in a way that nobody else ever can. And then verse, verse 14 and 15. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And this, of course, is looking back to Numbers chapter 21. But I find it amazing that Jesus compares himself to a snake. I, I, you know, we, we use generally see the serpent as being a symbol of the devil. But here the serpent is a symbol of Jesus Christ, because in Numbers chapter 21, the people were being bitten by poisonous snakes. They had to make a brass serpent, put it up on a pole, and everybody that looked to the serpent would be healed. They had to look 
to the symbol of God's provision of healing. And that's that's the symbol of Jesus. We've got to look to him. We've got to put our faith in him in order to be saved. And so Jesus makes a snake a symbol of himself. I remember years ago I visited Armenia. Uh, I arrived at Yerevan in the shadow of Mount Ararat. And I remember going to an, uh, an Armenian Orthodox monastery. And you know, all around that monastery, there were like pictures of snakes everywhere. And I thought, man, this is weird. I've never been in a church setting where there's pictures of snakes everywhere. It seemed like something satanic or something. But they were doing it because of this particular scripture. Because Jesus said, I, if I be lifted up uh, like, like the serpent in the wilderness, uh, I, I, will, I will draw all men unto me. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Now, the next verse is John chapter 3, 16. But actually, we're, we're just about out of time now, and this is such an important verse. I don't want to gloss over it. I don't want, I want to give it the attention and care that it deserves as a pivotal declaration of the gospel. So we will return to John chapter 3 next week, next Wednesday night, and we will start by looking at John 3, 16 together. But uh, we're going to wrap up this study tonight. I want to thank you for joining me in my study. Again, this is not a sermon. This is not carefully prepared sermon notes, but rather we are sitting with the Word of God. I'm going through it verse by verse and just sharing with you the things that the Lord shows me as I sit and study His His Word as I love to do. So I just want to pray for you now and then we'll close this for tonight. Heavenly Father, I just thank each thank you for each person that's joined us for this uh, online a Bible study tonight. And Lord, I pray that the revelation that you give us from your word will bear fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and join us again next Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. for another episode of Upon This Rock.